wine back in the day wasn't something that it is now. It was an accompaniment. It wasn't the star of the table. When you look at Southern Italy, there's so many darn flavors there and so much delicious, spicy food and fresh tomatoes, peppers, greens, artichokes. Maybe it's a little more difficult for wine to be the standout star of that. Because the flavors are so intense. There's so much else going on at the table, so much other intensity. Everybody loves Burgundy, but what does one eat in Burgundy? There's some nice Boeuf Bourguignon, there's some nice snails, but it's not the same thing as having pasta with sea urchins and clams and peppers and all the different sauces. They drank it as a food, as a very simple pairing, and did not savor wine to the extent that we do today. Have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 164. Are you curious about the hidden wine gems in Southern Italy? Who are the colorful characters and winemakers who create them? And what are the sumptuous flavors of the region, and how well do they pair with wine? You'll hear those stories and more during our chat with Robert Camuto, who has just published a terrific new book called South of Somewhere, Wine, Food, and the Soul of Italy, about the people and places of Italy. Now, on a personal note, before we dive into the show, with the continuing story of publishing my new wine memoir. Um, This memoir is kind of like Sex and the City meets Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce. I said when the editor asked me for comps or comparable titles. Publishers need to know where your book fits, which books might be shelved next to it in a bookstore. This also gives them a sense of how large the market is for it. Well, what about the darker side of wine aspect? The editor asked. Well, I guess it's also like the wine version of Kitchen Confidential, Anthony Bourdain's expose on the restaurant world, and Drinking, the love story, Carolyn Knapp's memoir about alcohol addiction. And how about the love story in triumph over a devastating attack, the editor asked me again. I guess it's a bit of Bridget Jones' diary and the Queen's Gambit. You know, I think we're going to have to build a bookshelf just to explain this memoir. So that's the challenge in defining what a book is by what's already been published. It's the literary version of the elevator pitch. In my small but mighty beta reader group, several people have commented that the book reads like a movie. One person was more specific, saying it was a mystery thriller first and then turned into a rom-com, romantic comedy. She was hesitant to say this to me, thinking it would be an insult, but I'm actually thrilled. These days, books compete for our attention with movies, TV, social media, life. So they need to be fast-paced and engrossing, like a movie, or they'll be set aside, probably permanently, after just a few chapters. So have you read any books that feel or read like movies? Let me know. You'll find a link to the blog post called Diary of a Book Launch, where I share more behind-the-scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 164. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, a link to the post, Diary of a Book Lunch, the full transcript of my conversation with Robert, links to his website and books, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com 
forward slash 164. Okay, on with the show. Are you curious about the hidden wine gems in Southern Italy and the colorful characters, winemakers, who create them? What has the winemaking revolution done or how has it changed the wine styles in Southern Italy, the wines you drink right now? What spectacular flavors in both food and wine can you expect if you visit the region? You are going to get all of those answers and a whole lot more from our guest. So, Robert Camuto is the author of three highly acclaimed books, the most recent of which is called South of Somewhere, Wine, Food, and the Soul of Italy. Just love that. It's both a personal memoir of his Italian family ties and delicious travels over Italy over the last 50 years, as well as a portrait of Italy's modern food and wine scene, the Renaissance that's going on today. It was named among the best wine books by both the New York Times and the Washington Post and a host of other review outlets. His previous books were Corkscrewed, Adventures in the New French Wine Country, followed by Palmento, a Sicilian wine odyssey, which is also quite popular. Since 2008, Robert has been contributing editor for The Wine Spectator, where he writes a column twice weekly for the Wine Spectator's website. He's a graduate of Columbia University School of Journalism, That's the top in the business. He worked as a news reporter and features editor in Texas before moving to France in 2001. And he and his wife moved to their current home in Verona, Italy, which just sounds dreamy. And that's where he joins us now. Hello, Robert. Hello, Natalie. So good to see you. Thank you for having me. Oh, great. Sounds like you're next door, which is awesome. (laughs) Yes. And the column is twice monthly, not twice weekly. So I don't want to build up too many expectations there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we don't want your editor to get a hold of that either. You'd be very busy. No time to write books. So, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So, Robert, before we dive into the book, can you remember the exact moment that you wanted to become a writer, whether it was a wine writer or just writer, writer? Tell us about that. Yes. The exact moment I decided I wanted to become a writer when I was in high school and I was 15 years old. And I read Jack Kerouac on the road, which I think was a book that transformed so many people's lives. It was, of course, written in the late 50s, probably right before I was born. But as a teenager, there was just something that really spoke to me, the idea of the open road and the freedom and the great expanses of space that first off, that we find in um, North America, in the U.S. or Canada. I mean, just anybody who's driven across the continent has experienced that. I guess I would bring it forward to today. I mean, I do still love that open road in Europe. Things are a lot smaller, obviously, and a lot closer. But it's great that you can completely change environments and climates by driving across the country and you don't have big places in the middle like Nebraska or Kansas to drive across of nine hours of just like... right <laughs> exactly so that book gave you that wanderlust for new experiences new flavors new climates and so on that that's fantastic very pivotal it's a book I should go back to read it a long time ago like you but not recently well I, when I've gone back and read it I mean it is not as fantastic the third time, I'd say, but... Right. Well, the book hasn't changed, but you have. Yeah, so it's kind of a yes, touchstone yes. with, you know, how you've changed. So not to be Debbie Downer here, but take us to the worst moment of your writing career, if there has been one. Maybe it's been all unicorn and sunshine, but is there a moment you recall over the decades that you've spent writing that was kind of the lowest point? Well, I would say... Probably one of the low points is I worked in journalism for a number of years as a freelance magazine writer, as a newspaper reporter in Texas. And when you said that, one thing that jumps into my mind was when I was writing my first book, Corkscrew Adventures in the New French Wine Country, and all hell seemed to have broken loose on the political front, I mean, you know, there was the, uh, I don't even remember the day, I mean, the Iraq war, all of this, and you had Americans pouring out 
French wine in the street and there was all this antagonism and everything like that. And I'm saying, oh my God, what a terrible moment to be coming out with a book on France. So I was pretty bummed about that. Oh. But by the time- Wow, yeah, the timing. Out, it came and it went quickly, so. Well, that's good. That's, that's fortunate. And let's end on a happy note. What has been your best moment so far in your writing career? You know, I've just had the opportunity to meet so many fantastic people, to do so many interviews with original characters from local contadini to... And what does contadini mean for those of us who don't know the term? A uh, contadino is like a peasant or, you know, like it's what people would call themselves, you know, people who work on farms. And so the singular is contadino, the plural would be contadini. So, you know, very kind of simple people, rural people who are really based on the land, who live on the land, to experience that all the way to, I've been lucky to interview people like Sting, for example, you know, in his property in Tuscany. And what I did enjoy about him is, I mean, he admits, you know, look, I know nothing about wine. And he wasn't trying to say, oh, yes, and impress. And, uh, What's his winery called? Il Palagio. Is his name anywhere on the bottle? No, but he, does, he did have some of these song titles that were used. For example, Message in a Bottle is one of them. I think Sister Moon was one of them also. But one distinction that I want to make here is that there's so much talk now about celebrity wines and these celebrity brands. And look, me, I've got a you know, new wine and blah, blah, blah. I mean, one thing that I do respect about people like Sting or say even a, like a John Malkovich and his project in Provence is that they have skin in the game. They at least own the vineyards, which makes people sweat over it more. It's not somebody coming in and saying, okay, here's a cool branding opportunity. I'm going to slap my name on a bottle and that's it. And I think that once you get into actually owning vineyards and having to make decisions and investing, I think it's a whole different level than just say doing a branding opportunity and that sort of thing. I have to agree. The one I'm most impressed with is Pink, the singer who owns Two Wolves in California. And her name is not on the label, but she's taken all of these enology courses and she actually helps to make the wine. She not only owns the winery, but she actually helps to make it. And she kept it a secret for a long time that that was her winery. It's only been in the last few years that she's made it public that she owns it and she helps make the wine. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it is cool. <laughs> Good for her. So tell us in a nutshell, what South of Somewhere is about. I love the name too. So give us some background on that too. Well, to start with the name, the reason why I called it South of Somewhere is, and I say this in the introduction of the book, Italy is not really a country as we think of countries, you know, where you have a, sort of a unified nation and national outlook. And it's really a collection of villages or, you know, paesi as they call them. And the loyalty is really to the local bell tower. Why is that, the local bell tower? I think it's a way of speaking. They say uh, Italians are campanalista. So it means that from this side of town, you know, they have their football team, their olives, their, you know, from the other side of the, you know, and it keeps going on and on and on like that. So it really is a collection of cultures, a collection of languages, and a collection of really different histories from like the north where I am was dominated by Austria and part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for a long time. It had the Piedmont, which was more, you know, attached to Sardinia and had more French ties. Naples and Sicily, you had the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, which was really run by the Spanish sort of French Bourbons, even after they had their heads chopped off in the French Revolution. And then you have the central part, which was really the um, church states. And I think each one of those creates a different kind of culture and a different way of thinking that's embedded in people's way of thinking. Oh, and also I wanted to mention, and in central Italy also, you know, you had Tuscany and the Medici. 500 years ago, they were dealing in derivatives just to the east of there and south of there in Umbria 
people were looking to the church and church taxes. And, you know, that's what ran the land and the landscape. A sophisticated financial system with the Medici derivatives, which still goes on on Wall Street. Yeah. And yet the very sort of almost abacus like South. How did that have an impact on winemaking? You know, just to finish on the idea of south of somewhere. So I think in Italy, there's this idea that being south of somewhere is like being more Tironi, like you're more attached to the earth, you're more agricultural. And sometimes northerners look down on southerners. But I think that it also gives Italy part of its humanity. Like people say, just remember, there's always someone that is more southern than you are and you are more southern than somebody else so it's all kind of a relative view of that there must be somebody who is the extreme south at the end of the boot or the (laughs) end of sicily yeah but you know sometimes it's geographical and sometimes it's psychographic Uh, okay okay so i remember for example in the calabria chapter there was someone who said oh if you go to reggio calabria it's like sicily 50 years ago So that would be north of Sicily, but they consider it more rustic, more primitive, more attached to the Tera. So I think that one of the general aspects of the South is that it has remained more primitive, less industrialized, less consolidated. I mean, I live in the North, for example, where, you know, you had a lot of families, a lot of investment in areas like Valpolicella, et cetera, et cetera. And really, I think the Italian wine renaissance in general has really happened over the last around, let's say, 35 years, where there was a real push to do better. And it started with a kind of a scandal, the methanol crisis where they found it was actually in the north, in the Piedmont, where some large producers had been putting some nasty things in wine to add texture. And that was called I the methanol. I assume it wasn't scale. lethal. It was just, oh my gosh. And it actually was lethal. There were people who died from it. And there were some terrible things that occurred because of it. And I think that was the big reset for Italian wine, that you know you had people coming out of the Piedmont, like Gaia and other people of saying, okay, we really have to now focus on quality to bring this thing back. I mean, Italy has the grapes, it has the potential, and it kind of just flipped. I mean, I think that's when you had hygiene come in, studying a lot of the greatest techniques in the world, mostly from France. You also had a lot of French barrels coming in and a lot of that influence. But I think that's when enology really took off in Italy. And I think that it's taken a while for the South to get the memo where things are a little slower moving. There hasn't been the investment. Things are a little not as wealthy. It's just taken, yeah, more time to get that memo. And is that why there's so many more indigenous or local grapes in the South versus the rest of Italy? That is a great question. And I think in general, that's true because Italy has been very resistant to consolidation. So the good aspect of this is that when maybe you had other regions in Europe that were wealthier or even in Northern Italy saying, okay, let's do this. Let's get out the tractors. We're going to pull all this out. We're going to bring in these new things. We're going to plant Cabernet, Chardonnay to the max. And in the South, that didn't happen to the same degree. The farms were a lot smaller. Even if you look at the average size of a farm in Italy now, it's like five acres. France is 25. California, many, many times that. So I think having these small family plots did keep a lot of local grapes intact, the old vineyards. And I think now we're in a period where people aren't looking to necessarily have wines that are like something that they've had elsewhere. They're looking for unique experiences. Definitely. I think that's something that the south of Italy really excels in. And I think it's a little bit like archaeology. These young winemakers now can kind of go into their grandparents' vineyard and say, okay, what do we have here? What can we do with it? How can we valorize it 
what do these grapes want to make fantastic wines? What kind of techniques? And- right. That must be a challenge because, as I understand, in a lot of traditional winemaking regions, they were field blends. So it wasn't like a field of just Nero Davila. It would be like all these different varieties. You wouldn't have that uniformity. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And to an extent, that's still true. Like if you look at the vineyards of the Amalfi Coast, I mean, they're just so rugged and so tough and just these tiny little parcels. I mean, they're some of the most beautiful vineyards in the world. I call them uh, airwar instead of terroir, because when you're up there, all you see is blue sky and blue sea. So yes, field blends still do exist and have their places. But I think when you look at people like drilling down into certain varieties and trying to understand what they have and propagate them, that does take a lot of study and a lot of time. Of course, as you know, Natalie, in wine, you only get one shot a year to make wine. You only have one harvest. So, Yeah, absolutely. Let's go back to the beauty of that place, because as I understand it, it inspired both the start and finish of your book, South of Somewhere. Maybe you can tell us why, like you have something you call a summer of love. Maybe tie that together. Yes, yes. Well, the summer of love, that was when I was 10 years old in 1968. I guess in San Francisco, wasn't the summer of love? I don't know if it was 67 or 68 anyway. It was around that time and everybody's listening to music and flower children and, you know, inebriating with trying different chemicals and the whole thing. Well, I was 10 years old and I went with my Neapolitan grandmother to the village of her birth, where she and both my maternal grandfather were from, called Vico Equenze, which means literally the way of the little horse. And it's on the Sorrento Peninsula. And the town itself sits on this very high cliff where there is a little church called Santa Annunziata. It's so evocative because when you're down by the sea, you see this cliff with this church on top and you see Mount Vesuvius off in the distance on the other side of the Bay of Naples. And suffice it to say that every year when they do a poll of the Italian press, of what are the most romantic churches in Italy to get married? Like it's usually in the top three. So anyway, this beautiful place. And then there, there's a hill that goes down and full of olive groves and that kind of thing that goes down to the marina. And at the time, a distant part of the family had a pizzeria, which was the only sort of restaurant down by the sea. And it was just these spending the long days and afternoons between town and the sea and absorbing all these kind of Mediterranean smells and flavors. That's where I really got my first impression of what does the Mediterranean look like? What does it smell like? And of course, the people there who were in our family, I have incredible memories of as a 10-year-old with you know, me and my cousins, whenever we asked them, you know, for anything, it was like, why not? Why not? Per que no? Yes. You can, you know, and it was like whatever we wanted to do, there was just this incredible feeling of freedom in this little town. And I think for me, this is a big anniversary for Marcel Proust, 2022. It's the hundredth anniversary of his death. And you know, Proust wrote about that Madeleine from his childhood this biscuit that brought back all these memories of flavors to him. And for me, that trip was like one great big Madeleine. Like I remember like an ant's, you know, the smell of the stovetop espresso, the taste of, you know, eating figs for the first time, these little Neapolitan sweetbreads and pastries, and of course, all the great food and flavors that came from there. That's magical. Did they let you taste the wine? Uh, yes. Well, you know, always, you know, from when I was little, even in New York, I used to open my grandfather's wine, which he had actually made wine in New York before my time. But then, you know, by that time he graduated to, he made it in the cellar, but he had his fiaschi of Chianti and I would open that. And wine was always at the table. 
But to be truthful about it, I mean, wine back in the day wasn't something that it is now. You know, it didn't have the place at the table, I think, especially in Italy and especially Southern Italy. It was an accompaniment. It wasn't the star of the table. But I like to say, too, is when you look at Southern Italy, there's so many darn flavors there and so much good, delicious, spicy food and fresh tomatoes, peppers, greens, artichokes, what have you, that maybe it's a little more difficult for wine to really be the standout star of that. Because the flavors are so intense. Yeah, yeah, that there's so much else going on at the table. There's so much other intensity. And I'm, what I like to say about it is, I mean, look, everybody loves Burgundy. And I've been to Burgundy many times. But what does one eat in Burgundy? I mean, yes, there's some nice Burf Bourguignon. There's some nice snails. But, right. you know, it's not the same thing as having pasta with sea urchins and clams and peppers and all the different sauces. Yeah. So in that respect, I mean, wine was... Uh, part of the table. Also, people didn't have that level of sophistication and education where they really tasted wine. I think they kind of drank it as a food, as kind of a very simple level pairing and did not savor wine to the extent that we do today. And part of it is, I think the quality is better. I do think that with a modicum of technology, Technology can be a dirty word in some uses, you know, where you're doing all things to make wine something that it's not. But I think technology in the sense of, in certain situations, controlling temperatures, protecting wine from air, and having a standard of hygiene can all be good things that bring out the complexity that we find in modern winemaking today. Absolutely. And you mentioned hygiene. That's not just the winemaker taking a shower for those who might not be aware of the technical details, but hygiene in the winery so that you don't get bacterial infections or whatever. A whole host of things can happen in the winery if you don't run a clean shop. But you've said that you're really fascinated with people and you like to understand what makes them tick. So you met a number of really interesting winemakers and people during your travels. Tell us about, I'm going to butcher his name, but Giampaolo Tabarini? Yeah, Giampaolo Tabarini. There you go. And just to your point about people, I think people are really important when it comes to wine because we talk about terroir. But who really makes terroir? It's really the right people doing the right things at the right time. We could be talking about Burgundy, we could be talking about Bordeaux, we could be talking about the Piedmont. In more modern times, to like Mount Etna on Sicily, I think around 2000, you had the right people coming together at the right time to transform what was a very sort of banal wine, just taking it to a higher level. And, you know, so... Giampaolo Tabarini is a crazy Umbrian winemaker. What I love about him is he's always going in a different direction, looking to go further, you know, eternally curious, always curious. He's from a town called Montefalco, which is known for Sagrentino. It's big red wine of the area. But Tabarini was also one of the few winemakers who had started making a white wine from what's called Trebbiano Spoletino. And Trebbiano is really an interesting name because there's so many different kinds of Trebbiano. There's Trebbiano Toscana, Trebbiano di Suave, Trebbiano from here, from there, and blah, 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 blah. And as Tabarini explained it to me, Trebbiano is just a name that just means, oh, the grape from here. So... It's just a generic way of talking about wine grapes. Well, they have this Trebbiano Spolentino because it's outside of the town of Spoleto. And I remember being intrigued with this white wine that he was making from these trees down on the valley floor that were planted in a way that's called Vigna Maritata. 
And it's these wines that are literally maritata, married to these elm trees. So they just grow up in the trees and everything like this. Up the trunks, the vines go up the trunks? Wow. And they would have these along the edges of property. You know, you'd have the elm trees. And they plant these vines in the middle. And in this case, so you have these Treviano Spolatino. And Taborini started making this wine named after his grandfather. It's called Adarmando. That became very popular, and it's a delicious, really great summer wine. When I asked him like, about the characteristics of this vine, from one vine, he was getting more than 100 pounds of grapes. Wow, put that in context. A yeah, lot, normally, a I mean, if you talk about, I mean, low yielding vines, I mean, they will often get two pounds of grapes from some, you know, it could be two, five, you know, eight in that region. And Tabarini is getting over a hundred, like 50 kilos. And he said, you know, I don't do anything. I don't do any treatments to it. Not even organic. I do nothing. You know, he said, you know, you could drop a bomb on this tree and it would still produce. And what I really liked about that story is it really kind of confounded the conventional wisdom. And I always liked those tales where, you know, you meet someone and you see somebody doing something. They're like, wow, that goes against everything that I've thought before. Because oftentimes in wine, you know, and I've used that term a lot to improve things, people have cut the quantity to improve quality. Well, here was a case where there was incredible quantity coming out of this grape. And around Montefalco, when people like Paolo Bea, he took clippings of these vines that he had, another producer, put it in a great terroir on a slope, better drain the whole thing, cut it in guillot form for like lower yielding vines, doing all the things that you would think would really increase the quality. And he was like, no, 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 I'm not satisfied. It's awful. (laughs) And then he said, there's something that happens between the vines and the trees. And what is it? There's some kind of symbiotic relationship. And He, I think, was kind of an architect or engineer, and he tried to make some synthetic trees to simulate, you know, how a vine would grow up in a tree. So as I say in the book, I don't know how the results are, but I'm kind of rooting for the natural system that's been going on there for 2,000 years. And, you know, there's just something so beautiful and romantic. Yeah, absolutely. When they pick the grapes, are these vines going way up into the tree? Like, are they climbing a tree to pick these grapes? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they go with ladders. Wow, that is wild. That is wild. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. The two plants must be talking to each other or something in this marriage. Yes, yes. That is a great story. Yeah. Other stories from Tabarini. He's done other experiments where... Just in the countryside where his father's found these crazy grapes growing on the side of houses. And he's worked with the university in Perugia and Florence to figure out what they are, to, you know, select them and repropagate them. So, Wow. Sounds like an interesting character, for sure, with interesting ideas. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Robert. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I love listening to Robert describe the vivid flavors and people of Southern Italy. It makes me want to return there. In my second book, Unquenchable, I devote a chapter to Sicily and talk about how the active volcano Mount Etna influences both the wines and the mindsets of the island. I highly recommend you visit this magical place as well as drink the wines here. Two, I'm drawn to stories about specific people, and Robert has many of them. I think the specific tells more about the universal than generalizations do. So I think we learn more when Robert focuses on individual people. Really, you start to get a sense of the people and the place there more generally. 
And three, his mouth-watering descriptions of the food make me yearn to taste them, if only in my own kitchen for now. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, a link to the post Diary of a Book Launch, the full transcript of my conversation with Robert, links to his website and books, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 164. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or want to be a beta reader of my new book at natalie at nataliemclean.com. You won't want to miss next week when we continue our chat with Robert. In the meantime, if you missed episode 99, go back and take a listen. I chat about how family-run wineries are different from those that are corporate-owned with Henry of Pelham Winery's Daniel Speck. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Wineries are very good candidates for family businesses because everybody on a farm ends up participating one way or another. The kids are out there, the husband and the wife are somehow involved together. They're small businesses for the most part, and they can grow and become bigger businesses. But people are quite invested. Their childhood is tied up in the thing. There's a sense of carrying on a legacy, perhaps. There's also a lot of passion and pride associated with what you're doing. And it's kind of the romance of a winery. It's kind of what makes it cool. It means that you're making longer term investments that aren't looking for quarterly payoffs, typically. Whereas the public company is under a different kind of stress. Public companies need to show returns fast. They can't always take those long, long term investments that a private company would take. Most wineries, frankly, are family owned businesses for that reason because vineyards take years to come into production. That's Wine true. takes years to age in barrel or so. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your class this week. Perhaps a full-bodied Sicilian red. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.